again, appreciate everybody uh, for being here. The, the real goal of this is, uh, frankly, I think a lot of us realize that we talk to lots of people all day long, but we rarely talk to our peers. Uh, we talk to our clients, we talk to our partners, we talk to our employees, we talk to our friends, but it's pretty rare that we get the opportunity to talk as peers, people who are uh, senior in the design business. And um, uh, uh, and that, there's a real opportunity for that. And for, for some of you in this room, I've had the opportunity to do that. And I realized, wow, it's kind of nice, right? Because we share a lot of things in common, uh, things that we can talk about. Uh, and um, so we decided that this was sort of a good opportunity since we're all in the, the Zoom world. It was easy, a low commitment to do something like this. So um, as we said up front, let's just do, just so everybody knows who everybody is, a quick introduction. Um, I'll start. So I'm Randy Herbertson. I um, uh, currently own the Visual Brand, which is a uh, innovation studio based in Westport, Connecticut, in a not quite a cool space as Alex has, but it is a an old uh, 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 post office that we have taken over a big chunk of in downtown Westport. And I sit on the AIGA board in Connecticut, used to in New York, and a few other things. Alex, you want to go next? Sure. I'm Alex Isley. I'm a graphic designer, like you guys, and uh, I, I, my office is in the teeming metropolis of Georgetown, Connecticut. I started my business 33 years ago in Manhattan, but have been here for over 20, 22 years. And um, yeah, that's, uh, and I still kept my office open, except like I said, it's usually me there or one other person. And um, it's, it's nice to be able to speak with all you guys. Likewise, Alex, thank you. Bob, how about you? Well, it's a pleasure to, uh, to join you guys. Um, my name is Bob Handelman. I'm a, um, a commercial photographer. I actually started out as uh, in the ad business at DDB Needham in Chicago. Um, I'm based in Guilford, Connecticut, and had spent many years uh, in New York, had a studio there, uh, primarily lifestyle and portraiture. Um, have been on the New York uh, and Connecticut ASMP uh, photo organization boards in the past uh, and have more recently um, been really um, enjoying you know, participating in the AIGA and CADC uh, events and have um, participated as portfolio reviewer for some of the events in, in the past and just um, love being in and around uh, other creative collaborators here in Connecticut and, uh, and afar. So um, and I will say that studio is at home, so I do have the home, and I considered building in one of those, you pull a, a book and it would go to the, to the bedroom. <laughs> this is actually, I have to physically feel like I'm leaving. So I go out into the garage, out of, and there's an interior door and an outside door. I haven't gone so far as to get into the car, go across, exit the car and go in. So I do a mini commute, but it's very I'm very glad to be here. Great, Bob. Thanks, Bob. John, how about you? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm, you know, excited to be part of this. And and uh, you know, I, I honestly recognize <laughs> all your names. I haven't, you know, physically met everybody here, but um, I work. I started out at a place called Taylor Design in Stamford. I worked there for seven or eight years. I think some of you guys probably know Dan. Uh, Alex, I think he, yeah. he Dan loves to tell this story that. Um, he, he walked uh, into an interview with the M Co where you were walking out, or was it Pushpin Studios, one or the other? And, I can't uh, remember. And he says, you got the job, and he didn't, but <laughs> oh. <laughs> going back quite a ways. Um, That's funny. But yeah, um, so, you know, I have a ton of respect for everybody in, in this group, so I'm happy to just, just be invited. Um, so, I work, you know, after Taylor Design, so, you know, I started off, you know, cut my teeth on, uh, on logos, uh, brochures, editorial, you know, the, on the focusing on the craft side of things. And then, um, and then I went over to uh, a place called Catapult Marketing, um, which is no longer there. It got bought out by Epsilon, but, you know, the focus of my career really shifted more towards the concept side of things. Um, you know, working on more kind of above the line advertising, things like that. But, you know, uh, I'm still most comfortable with the, the title of graphic designer, but, you know, I've had a number of different 
titles throughout the last seven or eight years. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Greg. Hi there. Um, appreciate being involved in this too. So, uh, so thank you, Randy, for gathering all of us. Um, I own an agency in South Norwalk. We're a 10 person creative shop um, called Ingenuity Design. And we focus a lot of our efforts on employees. So I have a great network of, of, of clients, mostly on the West Coast. And we do a lot of employee driven work. So that's everything from HR and talent and diversity and culture, um, you know, benefits. And sometimes it's PowerPoint presentations and storylines with executives, um, but it's also everything from branding events um, and a culture events and different things that we do. So soup to nuts, it's videos and branding and different things that the team does, but uh, in-house creatives and writers and uh, account and project management. Great, thanks Greg. Peter. Hey everybody, nice to be here. Randy, thanks for pulling this together and, and Kelly as well. Yeah. Um, my name is Pete Senna, I'm the co-founder and now CEO of Digital Surgeons. Um, we're headquartered in New Haven, Connecticut on our campus district, which is a tech innovation campus. Um, love to have you folks there when it's safe to do so. Uh, what a weird year it's been, right? Um, my background's in creative tech. So I've been doing design engineering UX for a really long time. We focus primarily on three areas right now, mostly um, on branding and brand experiences, primarily oriented in the digital space, but we do work across channel. Um, and then we also do a lot of demand generation from a, a digital experience design perspective and a marketing perspective. So um, definitely love to be here with, with lots of you folks. I know we've got some, uh, one of our amazing creative directors comes from Catapult. So I don't know if you know James, um, he's brilliant and been with us for a while. But yeah, no, we're, we're excited to, to be here and have digital surgeons be uh, represented. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Pete. And Christian. Buenas noches, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Christian Rivano. I am the owner of uh, the smallest, biggest agency you have never heard of. Uh, our name is Ripe, Ripe.agency. Uh, we used to be known in the industry as Chameleon Method. Um, in 2020, we changed our names um, because uh, a lot of changes were happening internally and externally. Uh, we focus primarily in the spirits industry. We have uh, a large portfolio of spirits. Um, in the past seven years that we've been around, we pitched four times, we won two, we lost two, and we made best friends to the people we lost. So um, that says a lot about how tight and close niche the spirits industry is. Uh, we have been very lucky, uh, and also we have been guided by uh, amazing lawyers and a great circle where our non-disclosure agreements have covered our assets along the way. Uh, where we have the opportunity to uh, work across multiple multiple brands, um, as long as we just don't bring any uh, any history to our new projects, uh, we specialize in um, basically on everything that relates to spirits. Uh, we are a through the line agency. Uh, we have touched uh, above the line and below the line, um, and the reason why we change our name is because uh, the digital space, which I was a computer programmer in my past life, and also a webmaster at Columbia University. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is that the spirits industry was um, missing out in a few digital integrations. So uh, we started tapping more and more with, uh, with the COVID that uh, arrived um, and the off-premise that got severely impacted uh, and the on-premise. We started uh, getting more and more involved into the digital space within the spirits industry. So. Uh, I said, we've been around for seven years. Uh, we used to be a large team. Uh, we used to be 10. Uh, we went down to eight, we went down to six, and now we are five. Uh, we are all working from home. We closed our studio uh, back in November. Um, I couldn't, I just couldn't justify having a studio for the sake of having it by itself. So I wanted to also integrate my team into this new way of working. You know, Facebook was doing it, Google was doing it, and we heard all, most of my clients are doing it. Actually, I believe all my clients are working remote. So we wanted to sort of be a part of that wave, uh, not only to sympathize with the way that we were working, but also to step into this new age of uh, working remotely. And we are around, um, knock on wood, that we're still here, you know, we are 
thankful and delighted that uh, we have been invited by Randy and the organization uh, to join this conversation. Thank you very much. Sure. Thanks, Christian. All right, I'm going to kick it off with a question I think we've all sort of touched on, we've thought about a little bit. Um, all of us, you know, have at least, uh, and most of us, have all of our teams remote. I actually may be unique that I've got several, uh, I've, I have my youngest male clients who have come back because they cannot stand looking at their apartment walls anymore. So I have a few people back, but uh, most of my team is, is, is virtual. Um, and obviously that's come with both uh, sacrifices and benefits. And so I just wanted to throw it out to the group. So what did you start doing in 2020 with your team that no matter what happens in 2021 with returning, you plan to continue. And really, what are those, what benefits you've found in the things you've done differently? So back to anybody who wants to answer it, and then I'm gonna call on you if you don't, if people don't jump in. Yeah, Pete. Sure, so I, so the, the one thing that I think was the most, so a couple of years ago, we built a, really amazing campus um, at, at District in New Haven. And we we basically wanted to build the Googleplex in Connecticut. It's essentially what, you know, just to simplify it for and not get into the, the background story. So to have such a beautiful collaborative space where we've hosted you know, these amazing workshops, brand workshops, experiences on workshops, I mean, you name it with just people from all over the world, um, you know, for-profits, non-profits, et cetera, et cetera. To go from that to COVID, um, to now everybody being remote was a little bit crazy. Um, similar to what Christian said, you know, we have, we made some hard decisions. One of which obviously we, because we own the campus and the building, it's not, um, as easily as just, you know, closing the office, I think for us in some cases, but we've definitely thought about a lot of those things. I think the first thing I would say, and this kind of probably, I'm curious to hear what Greg has to say, given the work that they do with HR and employee branding and stuff, clearly that's a, a core skill set of yours. The one thing I've learned a lot is just flexibility and the importance of delivering flexibility to my team. You know, we've got a lot of folks with, with small kids at home or pets and um, with everything happening, um, mostly with, you know, schools being closed and all those different things. I think the biggest thing I've realized about my team is how resilient they are. And I think that um, the benefits of creating that flexibility and creating that safe space, I think people really appreciate. So no matter what happens, Randy, in 2021 or 2022, um, I believe that we are going to be a hybrid organization and that um, we're going to have people that want to come together be, based on the type of projects. Um, I do believe that some work is really well designed collaboratively face to face. Uh, I, I'm still a huge fan of that. And I say that as a former introvert, um, but obviously now I'm much more client facing. Um, so the biggest learning for me is just embracing change. So one of our core values is, is all about being responsive to change. And I think that leaning into that was really, really helpful, but it was scary and it was weird. And I think we're still figuring it out. We're still figuring out the asynchronous versus synchronous thing. When do we Slack? When do we email? Like when's video appropriate? So still figuring it out. I'm curious to hear from Greg and, you know, obviously the expertise that you folks bring to you and your clients organizations, but yeah. that was the biggest thing is just flexibility and, and the need to, to tap into our human selves. Um, I don't think it, that was a big thing previous to COVID that I ever had to think about in 14 years. You know, we, we had probably the worst and hardest year um, of hard decisions. Um, so that's sort of my long-winded answer. It's a great answer, Pete. And and I think, you know, what a, what I would say just to, to, to build on that is, uh, and just my one little input is that I've never spent so much face time with my employees that used to sit two seconds away from me uh, as I do now. And that actually mm -hmm. certainly changes the dynamic for sure. Greg, pointing to you, what, what's been your experience and actually also how are you doing that with your with your clients? Yeah, you know, it's 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 interesting, Pete, because we have been at the forefront for a long time of knowing what cool Silicon Valley clients are doing between we have a football table and we have now uh, social impact days and we have all these different things. And if you spend time volunteering, we're going to give time back. Like all these different things were really um, brand new way back when, and we've been hearing about them for a long time. But I would say this year, we've been listening a lot more in the same way of becoming more flexible and hearing what people need and knowing that 
you know, um, mental time and downtime was okay. And, and letting everything become acceptable was really big for us. Not, not that we weren't always, we're family owned. My wife and I are partners in the agency. So everybody certainly comes to us knowing that we understand. Uh, we have kids and we juggle just like everybody else. But this year, more than any other, um, was a lot more listening of what people need and making sure it was totally acceptable to say, I can't show up today with no, without excuses, not why, not how, not anything. It was more of a, are you okay? Is there anything we can do? Um, we did do things that we try to keep consistent. So we had regular standing meetings every morning to try to check in with everybody. And they were really quick, um, regular kind of face-to-face. -face, and that was kind of our personal way of checking in with everybody and making sure everybody was still, you know, doing fine. We had somebody who left um, to go to California who's going to stay on board um, and they were, we were fortunate, they were fortunate that it just worked out instead of them landing a new job in California, they stayed on board and they haven't, they've been to the office just as much as everybody else, right? Which is none. Um, and so that has worked out for us, um, in many ways. Um, the benefits have improved. We've definitely now like matched volunteers and programs. We give people time to do that. So all of those things that make people feel like they're really engaged has, um, elevated our flexibility, elevated our perspective, all of these things as owners. Um, and some of that is just like intel of what our clients are doing and making sure that we can't just be preachers of that, of saying like, hey, yeah, we can design you a program that's all about diversity and inclusion and then not do that for us. So we just had somebody do a four-week session of group you know, kind of not to say group therapy, but like group conversations of leading difficult, really um, um, engaging conversation with all of us on Zoom. Um, and that has allowed us to feel that much more empathetic to our clients who are now going through that with employee resource groups and diversity things um, with everything that's happened over 2020. So um, loaded question, obviously I can go on and on about it, but I won't, so thank you. That's great, Greg. Yeah. Yes, Christian. Um, uh, thank you so much for all these like very insightful ways of looking at uh, what we've learned in two, 2020 and how we've changed. Uh, I think um, as I've been an entrepreneur and a business owner um, and what I would like to consider in the eyes of my grandmother, uh, a successful business, um, uh, I think that one of the things that I've learned in 2020 was to not be, uh, uh, to steal your word, uh, uh, an introvert entrepreneur. Um, there is a lot of uh, entrepreneur uh, habits and 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 things that we get used to doing. You know, like yes, we all deal with, you know, the P and Ls and the books and the accountant and like we're send we're sending the tax forms and I mean like there's a lot of paperwork that needs to be done and. Like Greg, uh, we are a minority-owned business, uh, a woman-owned business, uh, so half and half, and there's a lot that we take on ourselves. But in 2020, we learned something new. Is if we want to um, sort of like go through this period together as a creative agency, we have to let our employees realize that ourselves are also going through some things. We had to we had to bring them into our personal life a little bit more. Um, where before the entrepreneur business minded was very extracted in my, in, my, in my head, you know, I was like, you know, I'm doing all the back end, I'm doing all, a lot of the, you know, HR, IT, you know, cleaning services, I'm doing all this. Suddenly I realized that I can't protect them anymore. I'm, I'm taking hits everywhere, you know, uh, my, you know, I'm, where is the next blow coming from? So what I did is I put my guard down, I stopped defending everyone. And I said, it's time for all of us to defend all of us together. In a way, I leveled the playing for everyone. Um, I treated everyone like they were, all, they were, they were themselves business owners. Um, that was a huge learning for me because I was always very proud of being an entrepreneur but I wanted to let everybody know that with COVID and with everything we have suffered and the fact that we're still around, we have all survived an era that have made many of us entrepreneurs. Even if we don't own the business, uh, people have 
um, to work with, you know, holding babies and, and and one mouse in one hand and feeding the baby in the other. And they have to, you know, just relieve their wives because they have a meeting or they have to take the call when the dog is barking and the client is actually briefing us. And so every single one of us adapted so much where the entrepreneur spirit kicked in for all of us because we were all fighting for the same cause. And an entrepreneur fights for a cause, but now my employees are fighting for the same cause, which is the survival of the agency. Um, I love that. It's so beautiful. I appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, Christian, it's funny when you say that. One of the things that occurs to me when you say that is that it is probably a lot to do with the fact that employees are self-driven at this point because they don't have me standing over their shoulder or one of their other supervisors. And I do actually feel my team all takes a stake in a new way now. They take responsibility uh, in a remarkable way. And I will tell you, I had an, an employee that failed in this and had to be let go because he couldn't do it, right? He needed that right on top of you and he just literally didn't accomplish it. But literally everybody else is, is, has done that. So that's a really great insight. Yeah. Alex, what's, what's been your, what's your thoughts? Uh, you know, it's, it's been a tough year for us, to be honest, because every business advisor I've ever had says the way to be successful is to pick one industry, focus on that, become the expert, uh, and then fame and fortune will follow. And I've never been interested in that to my own detriment. I've really tried to sort of diversify my portfolio of clients really across a pretty wide board. And that's something I've been proud of is for a small firm like us, it's only six of us, can works on a lot of different types of projects. And I thought, well, that would put me in a good position when the economy kind of stopped last March. But Basically, all of our clients across the board put brakes on projects they were working on. So we were really sucking wind for a while. I mean, we still have some ongoing work with clients, but it's nothing nowhere near the volume that it has been. So we've really been having to sort of think about who, who's working on what, doing stuff to promote ourselves. Um, you know, I'm an optimist. So, you know, I figured it would come back. And oddly enough, after the, um, you know, after the, the, inauguration a few weeks ago we got like three calls the next day of people wanting to reactivate projects so I'm taking that as a good sign but um you know we've been working from home and like I said I rotated I'm there every day except people come in one or two days a week so I can see them face to face because while working remotely has its benefits I think for big picture things it works out really well but when it comes down to the detail I feel sometimes things are getting lost and I'm still kind of old school. I like putting things up on the wall or looking at them together and working on the details. And I find that frustrating. So, but we're rethinking the way the business works. I don't need all the space I've got. You know, I've got a rel relatively large office because I like spreading things out and not feeling that I'm working in a submarine, which when I started in New York, we had these tiny little crappy offices and everything was cr crowded. So I thought when we move here, I'll have more space, but I had a tenant, they moved out, they broke their lease a, a few months ago. And it's been sort of, you know, so I'm looking at downsizing the physical space just because I'm realizing I don't need like storage for books and things of that sort. So there's a lot going on and it's all operational in terms of the way that we approach our work. It's pretty much the same way in the sense that, you know, the designers that work for me, I give a lot of responsibility and I serve as their editor and their art director and I never really stare over their shoulder. I'm not one of those kind of designers that pulls up the chair and sits next to their workstation. I actually think that's rude and insulting. So I always kept my distance and we would meet, you know, at standard times and we still do that. It's just like from afar. So I guess what I'm saying is I, I don't think it's changed the way that I approach the work except the designers who work for me, since they do a lot of their work at home, they've had to become more self-sufficient. We check in, we're on, you know, we're on, you know, we're, we're constantly, um, you know, on Slack, you know, but um, I'm not, I know I'm really not answering your question other than I think sort of the physical space is really what's being affected the most and how we interact with each other on a human level. Um, and that's really, you know, it's not as inefficient as I thought it would be. It's actually working out pretty well. It's just, it's a little, little bit harder work. I had a follow-up question for, for Christian and Alex, if that's okay, Randy. I don't know if that's yeah, sure. acceptable, but 
Um, you got me thinking a lot, Alex, when you said like you miss putting stuff up on the wall. And I kind of lit up when you said that because I had this immediate kind of visceral connection energetically to say like, I miss the, the dustiness of a whiteboard on my hand when I'm like, when you're whiteboarding with someone in that energy transfer. So, you know, we've tried every tech tool in the book and we can certainly talk tools in a second, but I'm curious to hear from the group here, Alex specifically, because you just got me going on it. Energetically, now that you're completely remotely or remote, have you noticed a, a, a sort of shift in that, that energy, that kind of creative spark when you're coming up with a narrative or something that's really highly collaborative? I'm just curious to hear how you're sorting that out and how others are sorting that out. I, I miss that. Big I, time. I miss it. I still go in and I still, I was cleaning my whiteboard today and I still put things on the floor and on the walls. It's kind of lonely, except that's why I have people come in a day or two a week because I just, I kind of pounce on them because I still haven't found a way to transfer it to that energy because I kind of serve as, I think, a cheerleader and to sort of channel that excitement really and get rot, people right? psyched about stuff. And I can't do it remotely. So they come in and I kind of hope that with a day or two, I can goose them and that'll kind of, you know, they can coast for a few days before I can see them again in person. I haven't figured out how to do it remotely. You know, it's still, I mean, we're like 80% is efficient, I think. And I just, I, st I find that really frustrating. I haven't found a way to solve it because I still like being there and doing totally, it face man. to face. No, I feel it's you. Like, I feel like we're more efficient, but in my opinion, I feel like we're less effective. Can yeah. you? It's not so what, we, what we really are in many ways is more linear. So one of the things, I mean, one of my challenges certainly is that we, as a part of our business, we do a fair amount of industrial designs. So we're dealing with physical things. And so literally holding up physical things is challenging yeah. <laughs> in the virtual world. But I don't think it's, we just literally did, we, I have always liked to do group crits for bigger projects, identity projects, things like that. And again, like you, Alex, put them all up on the wall. Everybody walks around and let the entire team do it. And I just went through one last week for a pretty major project. And it took two and a half hours because it was linear. Because instead of this whole group thing, you know, he went around in a circle and every, and I wanted everybody a chance to comment and everything and look at everything. And, uh, and it was, I think everybody still appreciated it, but it was more linear. Okay. And so when you're in a bigger, when you're on a one-on-one, -on -one, it's one thing, but in a bigger group, it's hard to make it non-linear. And, uh, but you know, at least, at least we still did it. Yeah. Bob. So from a photographer's point of view, you know, I work in collaboration with, you know, art directors, designers, and um, I would say that there are many assignments, you know, where absolutely always want someone there on site. And then there are those assignments where um, things are established and based on the nature of the subject, the location, et cetera, where it's like, go, go make it happen. And although the, you know, my, my, my phone has always been here, I wasn't inclined to say, I can FaceTime, I can, you know, send screenshots, I can live stream, I can zoom, you know, we can set things up. So even on those assignments, so that, that's something that even though the technology was there, it wasn't customary. I just wasn't in that mindset, nor were the clients per se. And they said, you know, we've signed off to whatever level we needed to. And so that's been really liberating. Uh, you know, I always want to, you know, have the input. And it's been a great resource that I absolutely look forward to, um, you know, continuing and, and really, you know, uh, blowing out in, in new and different ways to enroll folks um, so that you know, I could go on, but that, that one I think is the, the big takeaway from this experience uh, is that we can collaborate um, in, in, and enroll essential people who may be from, you know, from client in one city, art director in another city, photographer on location, production crew, big or small. So that's, that's been something uh, I think we'll, uh, we, we will all benefit from always prefer to have someone on site, but if it's something that uh, it budgets, you know, logistics, feasibility, weather, this really is um, a great facilitator. Yeah, we've talked all about internally working with colleagues, but dealing with clients and people who may not have met you before, that's a whole different challenge. Yeah. And I will tell you, Bob, I had an uh, experience in, believe it or not, in April, we did a major shoot here uh, with models and the whole thing and a COVID environment and all the clients were on Zoom and it was a disaster. 
because <laughs> we're we're rolling around screens and trying to show them what it looks like, and uh, it ended up okay in the end. But it was it took twice as long. I I will put the disclaimer that it doesn't always work, <laughs> and that's one of the things that, like anything, workflows and you know, and the nature of the given assignment is going to greatly impact the effectiveness of it. However, having that as a Another option, I think, is uh, you know, clearly it has to be uh, bulletproof and beta tested. But uh, I think it's it's an added benefit moving forward. For sure, John. What's been your experience? Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I think in, in many ways, like the, my team, uh, especially you know the the, the younger uh, group of designers were, <clears throat> were much better equipped and prepared to to handle this than I was, to be honest with you. Um, they adapted extremely quickly. It, it was almost like, we, you know, <clears throat> nothing skipped a beat. Um, I, I took a full semester, I think it was, uh, it was a class at Syracuse. It was on postmodernism and it was, you know, it had to do with Marshall McLuhan and, and, but basically the class was about the movie, The Matrix. And so I'm like really, wary of, of, you know, getting to that point. And so I, I was just, I didn't want to get to the point where every time I interacted with somebody, I had to like plug in. Um, whereas nobody else seemed to have a, an issue with that. Um, so, so like I said, everybody adapted quickly and I was kind of maybe a little, little behind at first. I, I will say that, you know, especially at the agency, a lot of leadership on the creative side and on the account side, had uh, you know big uh, issues with kind of shutting shutting down and, and turning off, and not um, everybody was always accessible. Uh, you know because we had teams on our phones, and we you know you could just text somebody, and it almost seemed like you know they weren't giving their teams the proper time to kind of digest things or to re just to relax your brain, um, but. I didn't see that so much with the, the younger population. I felt like they were able to separate work from, you know, you know, from even from um, like social context, even if it was online, you know what I mean? There was two different kind of lives. Um, so, you know, I think it took me a little while to get up to, to speed on that. And, um, you know, and I'm get, definitely getting better, definitely getting better at it. But like I said, I, I learned a lot more from my colleagues probably than they learned from me. Although I will tell you that what I've actually heard even from recently young people is that just you sort of alluded to the boundaries when you're at home of what the, when the day starts and ends are gone, right? Because we don't longer have that separation of even if we're driving five minutes home uh, between, the, between the two. And certainly I'm sure a lot of our clients are in the same position. When they, when they finally get out of their Zoom meetings all day, which used to be live meetings, they get around to, to communicating. And instead of sending an email, they're texting us or calling us or whatever. And we're like, do I pick it up or do I just like let it go to voicemail and, you know, call them back in the morning? So, yeah. yeah it's no wonder why I can't ever get in touch with you, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> totally kidding. All right. I'm going to jump forward here just to another question. So we've sort of touched on this a little bit. But based on, you know, and Alex, I thought it was really interesting you talked about after your lectures, we had the same experience that that seemed to be a, a, a turning point for certain client or cat, even categories. But what do we see as our biggest opportunities in this changed world, which is going to be changed in one way or another, not just in the way we do business as an agency, but also in the world. And how do we feel, you know, given that a little better equipped to tackle those changes? Great, Greg, I'll toss that to you. Um, I think the talent pool is totally uh, um, rethought right now. Um, everybody, I mean, I'll, I'll ask you, but I mean, from the standpoint of what I'm hearing and seeing, we all thought our talent pool was the 25 miles that was, you know, the radius of whatever studio agency that we had. And now it's not. Now you realize like it's okay to look outside that box. Um, so from a diversity standpoint, that really helps us. We like having people who think different come from different parts of the world and, and can bring a different angle to us. And so the Fairfield County, like that's all we have. And I know somebody from this agency that went to that agency and I could reach out to this network and that network and we'll find a bunch of people to come interview. Um, doesn't have, 
have to happen anymore. And so I think that for many of our clients even um, is going to rock everybody's world. And this idea of like, you have to be in the city and you have to be close by to, you know, drive into work and commute and, and, and have to deal with traffic every day is, um, is long and, and forgotten. Now it's not going to be long and forgotten for many, um, but certainly that's an aspect of life and, and the job pool that's going to, you know, change for a while. So one of the things that you pointed out there, which occurred to me as well, besides, and again, I have a full-time employee that I hired uh, during this period who lives in North Carolina and probably never going to move and just a part of the team. But the other thing, which is really interesting is sometimes assignments go to people that are really close by, even for big companies. Cause they think, Oh, I want you to be able to come in and have a meeting with me. And now just like it's changed for employees, it's changed for clients when they realize Hey, it doesn't matter where you are. So it doesn't matter if uh, you, I can, you can come in for physical meetings because you're, you know, 20 minutes away. Now you can be almost anywhere. Yep. Kristen, Kristen what are your thoughts on this? What do you, where do you see the opportunities and are you going to tackle them this year in a changed world? I, I see opportunities in two fronts. So uh, one of them is internally at the agency side, the agencies that we're running. Um, but also at the client side. Now. Uh, the client side is what very well uh, articulated is I think that is we're breaking barriers, we're breaking frontiers, we're breaking this, you know, this small, or it was broken. We're not breaking it. It was broken for, uh, for us. Uh, and it's facilitating accessibility to a talent pool that we never had before. So that's, and that's something that we can also offer to our clients. But for, for the agency, I think one of the biggest opportunities, and I don't, I don't mean to get very dense on this topic. Uh, I'm actually just gonna tap into it a little bit. Uh, um, I think the way, the way we are um, managing creative people has changed. Um, our, our entire careers, I mean, I've been known for being a very passionate person, speaking with an accent in my hands, you know? Um, and that automatically puts me in a, in sort of like in a little box of like, this is one of those passionate people, you know? Um, so every, every now and then I will, I will get this weird reviews about, you know, like my personality and the way I was an, a graphic designer and an art director, I was an overachiever, but you know, that was my personality. One of the things I'm noticing is that our graphic designer pool, our graphic designer network, um, it's not the same than being face-to-face. -face. So our emotional intelligence of learning and knowing how to deal with people digitally has to adapt tremendously. Students, our uh, teachers are doing it in the classroom with the students to the point where like they're saying, not eat in the classroom, make sure that you have your camera on, make sure that you know you check in. Uh, they ask questions to students all the time, uh, make sure that people are you know, paying attention. So teachers are doing it in the classroom. We are, I am doing it with my network of graphic designers. I'm having to tap into their emotional state of mind during assignments, during briefings, during reviews. I'm having to make sure that, because I don't get to feel them. I don't get to, I don't get that sense. It's like, yeah. oh, you're in the same room that I am. He's looking weird. He's not paying attention. He checked his phone. He's in it. Right now, it's it's a different thing. So I need to engage them more. I need to break this barrier of the screen, grab him and bring him into this creative space. So that's a complete different way of creating. It's not the way we are, have all been trained. Alexander was tapping into it. I agree with Alexander. Randy, you've done it. Greg, we've all here um, have been exposed to that, to those type of environments. They're no longer the same. So we have to emotionally change the way we deal with people now. And, yep. and the way we greet them in the mornings is different than the way we used to greet them. You know, uh, the way we brief them is different. Um, it's, we are at, I think that we are just starting to learn how to be digital creative leaders yeah. uh, or, or virtual creative leaders. Um, I know that, I don't know, Greg, if you, if you are going into your agency and you still 
you know, seeing your 10 people. Nope. No. So yeah. I, I know for a fact that, and you dealing with, you know, the type of clients, some of these mega companies are putting a lot of money into training managers on knowing how to deal with individuals in a virtual uh, um, environment. So I think that we as creative people, we can't just go around anymore and saying, it's like, oh, you know, like he might be having an off day or like, he, no, there's, that, that's, that's not it anymore. Now we have to do it we have to reach inside and we have to like grab them from this camera, pull them into this space that they're not in and, and try to make them feel better, motivated, uh, happier. Um, and I think that that's what I'm learning. I'm learning a lot. I mean, I'm dealing with, Randy, you know the, the team, you know my team. Um, I don't know if the gentleman here, um, and um, the, uh, I, I, I forgot her name of the host. Um, Kelly. Yes, Kelly. sorry about that. So I, I, I don't know if everyone here knows that uh, uh, throughout my career, I've been, you know, I've, I've been trying to cut through uh, something that we have all suffered, which is um, ageism. And ageism, we have all been a part of it. And with, um, with COVID, uh, sort of uh, ageism put everybody in the same plane. You know, like there was no, suddenly like you realize that we can all suffer of some sort of like discrimination. Uh, I wasn't invited, I wasn't. So it's, it's so, it's so weird how my team now, which is uh, composed of peop very senior creative directors, I have done a job of like hiring people who have been let go because of ageism. Um, and, and I want to work with them because I don't want to throw away their careers uh, and I don't want to throw away my career also. I think that that's, that's, that's also, I have to retrain myself. How do I deal with senior graphic people? You know, people like us, people that are here. How do we do this more? So um, I, I know that it was a long-winded answer, but what I'm trying to say is um, I'm just really learning how to emotionally connect with my team at a different level because we are in a non-tangible space and we are defined by computer screens now. So um, it's a new learning for me. It's a new learning. I mean, I, I, I think I, the idea of being a virtual creative leader is a really interesting topic. And actually one thing I'll throw in there, um, <clears throat> it's very hard to, to hide when you're looking at face-to-face, -face, right? So you see that even with our teams or even our clients is that, you know, when you're in a meeting or something like that, there's a way to do things, even it's checking your phone or whatever, but it's, it's a very different experience in a face-to-face digitally. Pete, what's so, what are your thoughts in here? What do you see big opportunities that you'll, in the change world, and how are you going to tackle them? And this could also get into, Pete, things even from a tool standpoint. You, you referenced that earlier. So where do you see your opportunities to become more, uh, you know, better, more effective this year and going forward? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I, I'm reflecting on what Christian said and some of the stuff that Greg was saying earlier. Um, so it's interesting. So my background is in, so before I started Digital Surgeons, I was much more introverted. So as a someone in software design development, I lived in IRC chat rooms, lived on forums as a moderator. I've, I'm like a huge digital nerd, like, and I still am. Um, you know, despite running the company, I still, I still design and code and do all the things that we do for our clients, but I do them for myself outside of work. Cause mostly now my role as a leader is holding space for others, whether it's physical space, virtual space, whatever. Um, I'm curious to talk more with uh, Christian offline um, just because we probably won't get to it today about just how you level that play playing field and opened up the owner's mindset for your team. So I'd love to, to, to spend some time with you on that because Candidly, I, I think I take a lot of punches and sometimes I wonder how many of them are my fault versus how many of them I might be able to share like a little bit more Brene Brown vulnerability to use her term. Um, you know, there's definitely been some some things I think I've shepherded that I probably shouldn't have. I it probably would have been better to be more open about it. So that's good feedback. Um, to answer uh, Randy's question, I think what I've seen is a, a complete transformation as to how the work gets done. So typically... So we are very different because my co-founder and I don't have 
the we didn't start on Madison Avenue like a lot of folks, right? Um, and I think with with that, we were you know, we were starting a digital agency when that was still avant garde, right? That was still like in the days of like when Modem was like we're the first digital agency on the planet. It happens to be out of Connecticut, right? So we were we were there at the at the heyday, I think you know two thousand six, right? Um, so what I've seen going backwards to forwards is back then. I was much better communicating digitally with people like on IRC in chat. I was very articulate with my asks and my requests. The logic mind in my, as an engineer made it very easy for me to con converse with people. So being face to face and having to like orate to a client and pitch and do all those things that we've all had to do as owners now. Right. And as leaders, those things came hard to me in the beginning because I was an introvert. I'm like, just whatever. So what's funny is then, then I spent 10 years as an extrovert being in front of clients and, you know, pitching and driving narratives and, and figuring out how to make, you know, just shape, shape the story and shape, shape everything. Right. And now I'm, I'm feeling what Christian's describing, which is going from like, it's so much easier to just talk. Right. And like, that's the thing that I'm realizing is back in the day, I used to hate when these creative directors would get in front of me and they would just wonk on and, you know, with their big talk, which we all do now. Right. And I'm like, Oh, you know, like just, let's just get to it. What do we got to do? You know? And now I'm like, Oh shit. When I'm asking for something from one of my team members or from one of my clients, I'm like, let me just take a minute and articulate it because previously in the office, you just, you know, you get up and you're like, Oh, we just need to just do this. You know, like, we'll just do this. Right. So the switch and the shift I think is really interesting is how do people like to receive feedback? How do clients like to share it? We've been having a lot of luck with uh, Loom, L-O-O-M, the, the video platform, if you haven't used it yet. So what we do now is when we're presenting work, if the customer is inclined, I've noticed a lot of calls, people seem to be distracted. They're checking email, they're on calls. Um, so I just flat out called one of my senior clients from one of our, our Fortune clients. And I said, hey, it seems like you're on a lot of Zoom calls. It seems like you're really busy. How would you feel if I sent you some of the work in advance, you watch it on your own time. And then when we come together at the end of the week, live, we talk about the work. This way I'm not selling you the work and pitching you the work. And he's like, okay, I'll try it. So I go on Loom, let you record your screen like I'm talking to you folks right now. And we present the work, whether it's a deck or UX or whatever it is. We do a lot of UX design and it's clickable and you're taking them through it. You know, it's a mobile app or whatever it is. And the engagement rates have been amazing. Because what's happening now is I'm getting such quality feedback because instead of our clients being put on the spot and having to be like, oh, this widget window doesn't open the way I want it to, like they've actually thought about it. Because what I'm noticing now is we all go from meeting to meeting day to day. Everything is instant, the instant economy. Everything's so ephemeral, here, gone, here, gone. So now when we get into clients, I'm realizing the conversations are getting deeper. Where mm -hmm. by before COVID, the conversations were very shallow. And instead of me trying to and I speak, I'm speaking in my own experience. Obviously, I have a lot of team members that have different experiences, and I'd love for them to, to share some space with you folks as well. But in my case now, I feel like I'm having more intellectual conversations with my clients about data and about the impact of the work versus before I was just so concerned with tuning in the frequency of like, how do I sell that concept through? How do I make sure that, oh, I know that Alex is really into like bespoke typography. So like, I'm going to dial that up in this meeting. Now I'm like, you know what? I chose this typeface because it's going to solve these problems. And this foundry is really known for humanist forms in the letter forms. I don't have to sell it now because the client feels it. They watch the video and it's not a hard sell. So when they show up, if they don't like the typeface and I'm using a very tactical thing, right? But like I can get more strategic if you like, but like I've noticed that form of communication has been amplified. What I'm also noticing is some people are much better and much more comfortable not sharing content that way. They're more comfortable saying, I'm going to put some screenshots of my work in on an Envision. And in between the Envision panels, I'm going to write up an articulation that's a couple paragraphs. You know, and I've seen art directors that weren't the best presenters. And I'm not, not just saying on my team, I mean, just in general, I've, you know, some of our clients have in-house agencies. And I've seen just the brilliance of people when you let them communicate in their native language, whether it be writing or like, I had someone the other day that just sent me a, a motion video to express an emotion. I was like, that's awesome. But if you were to see them get up in front of a group of 10 people or seven people and present their work, you'd be underwhelmed. So I think that if we let people 
occur in their own space and their own medium, you get better work. And I think you also don't have to like feel that friction with the client because it's like, if they don't like something, they're going to find a way to tell it to you where it's not you selling or fighting with them. And that's been a big thing. I feel like I tell people like my job is like being the kindergarten cop of clients, right? Getting them to understand that like, we actually thought this stuff through. We didn't just throw it on a screen comp somewhere. So I don't know, I'm rambling now, but I don't know if that's helpful for you folks. It's not a show anymore. We don't have to enter a show. It's, there's no showmanship anymore. I agree. It's it's it's, it's uh it, it's it released. You know, it's it, it makes yeah. you feel better. You know, now now it's about you know the the everybody has seen a resume that says from concept to execution. Yep. Uh, the how you sell that it's a showmanship. Now it's all about you the know, work. The work. So the concept matters a lot more than what it used to before, I think, because because what how you explain it. Thank you so much for sharing that, Pete. No, for sure. Thank you for inspiring me to say this share that. I think it was helpful to think about your frame on space. I enjoyed so, Pete, one of the things that I have uh, spent some time thinking about, and actually it's part of a lecture that I do with students, is what I call fast processors and considered processors. And fast processors are those like instant, which you know, I'm one of those people you have million ideas, it's coming really, really fast. We tend not to be great listeners as a result, so there's adaptive learning. But considered processors absolutely aren't that. And so when they're forced to make a reaction, it isn't, it's a knee-jerk reaction a lot of times. And we've all seen this with clients where they go, I don't like that, okay? So that's the defensive response saying, I have not had time to, to think about that. So exactly to your point, if we give them the opportunity, and we all love, frankly, I think we all wait, we'd like to show the client the work at you know, in front of us, right? We prefer that, not to set it ahead. I so, know. You know, <laughs> I know. yeah. But you know, it's 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 the truth is that without the opportunity to discern it and think about it, I think you're right. We'll, I'll always get the best uh, feedback. Alex, what are your thoughts on this? I still, um, in terms of, I was getting back to what you're thinking about sort of presentation. You know, I miss the human factor, although. Weirdly enough, the six or eight months before COVID, we had a couple of projects where I actually have never met the client face to face. And I was nervous about that, but it worked out really well. And it gave me the confidence to present things. Um, I'm going to try what you suggest is sending something ahead of time and letting them stew on it. I've never had the nerve to do that, but I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by the idea about, you know, I usually value their responses that are very fresh where they don't put things up on the wall or show it to all their friends. You know, I like to get that initial gut reaction. So I'm tossing over my head how to, how to do that. But it's really, it hasn't been as much of a problem as I've, gonna, as I've thought. Although I do miss the times, trust is such an important part of what we do that really a key part of with a new client, sometimes they need you to just reach across and put your hand on their arm and say, I won't let you down, you know? And as soon as you say that, you can feel like the weight come off their shoulders because there's so many graphic designers out there. I mean, we have a lot of clients, you know, new t clients, they've been burned by somebody, you know, and uh, two thirds of my time is trying to convince them that I'm not going to let them down and I'm trustworthy. And I find it's a little harder to do if you'd never sat across the table from them. I know I'm not answering your question really, but it's just, you know, I'm thinking a lot about how to to sort of present in ways that aren't going to come back anytime soon. So um. part of, like you said, is making ourselves a little more vulnerable and a little less black box. And I think, you know, Pete, what you talked about does exactly that, even though that's not, again, the way we've always done it. Correct. John, what's been your experience? <clears throat> well, you know, I think the immediate opportunities, you, you guys have probably all kind of witnessed, you know, the connectivity, networking, but I'm, I'm ho hopeful and I, I'm a, a bit of an optimist myself is that, you know, coming in the latter half of 2021, that the real opportunity, especially for everybody here, you know, being business owners is that, you know, new business becomes a real opportunity once, <laughs> once people really start to realize you know, that if they haven't spent a lot of money on marketing the, the past year, that they're going to want to make up for that. Um, and, you know, I just 
coming from a large agency that's owned by a larger agency that's owned by a holding company. I mean, we've hemorrhaged millions and millions of dollars. And, we, you know, I've, I've literally seen probably 100 people just in Wilton get let go in, in the past two years, you know. Um, yeah, John, it, what, what company, um, could, you, could you disclose what company you work for? Because yeah, yeah. Well, then you probably you know you probably recognize the names. I work for Catapult Marketing, which yep. was part of Ryan Partnership. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, they came together. They were owned by Epsilon. Yep. We got bought out by Publicis, <laughs> uh, and um, and and Publicis, you know, French holding company owns everybody. I mean, Leo Burnett, Arc, yeah. uh, Sachiax, a lot of a lot of big uh, big name Razorfish that was there and then isn't there and came back. Um, I mean, it's just, it's, it was a rough year. So I, I'm hoping, you know, and mostly that when people start to, to, again, putting more money into marketing, branding, whatever, and you are seeing a lot of, you know, startups be, because of the pandemic, you know, people that, you know, finally realize they want to do their own thing. Um, I'm hoping that work comes, you know, to the, to the smaller to, to mid-sized agencies where they realize the, the value um, that they won't, have those large overheads that they don't have to cut through so much red tape, you know? Um, so hopefully there's business opportunities coming up. Yeah, hopefully some, I'm sure they thought was like I, you mentioned earlier, Alex, uh, we've had certain categories just absolutely disappear and that you hope will come back. <laughs> Fortunately, yeah. other ones haven't. Greg, what's been your, your experience on this and what are your thoughts on it? On, uh, on, I guess on which aspect of this, there's been a lot of good conversation. So just opportunities based on, you know, the world we're gonna be going forward in over the next year or so. Um, you know, again, I, I mentioned the talent pool. I think it's one thing that that's definitely gonna change. I think this idea of engaging with people, how to talk to people, how to give them space, how to comfort right. them, how to do all right. these things, um, you know, is huge. I think that we are now in a place that there's a whole new workforce that hasn't worked in an office. Like we're now into potentially two years of, of, uh, of an employee who's never seen an office before. And how do they then have a, like, that's a transition back to them. Like, Oh, I have to go to work. Like that's weird. So there, I mean, there's, there's just all of that too. I think that, I mean, I'm still old school and with Alex in many ways that you won't be able to, compete with meeting in person and seeing a client. And I used to go out to California every four or six weeks to meet with clients and just roam halls and check in with them. And it was always a, Hey, do you have five minutes while you're here? I didn't know you were coming out this week. Yeah. Come meet with me and work would pick up in the next couple of weeks. There'd be projects. And I don't have that. I can't just kind of randomly show up and say, Hey, let's go grab a coffee next door. When you have a few minutes, it's meetings and trying to schedule things and, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I do my best to check in and home, check in with, you know, clients and, and stuff, but it's not as natural and, and easy as uh, running into them, you know, in the hall and, and having a coffee either. I hundred percent. In fact, I just heard this from somebody else that I was talking to who's changing careers is that whole hallway conversation thing is, is gone. And actually I worked for a guy uh, who was actually a, a ex Ryan guy, as a matter of fact, John, a guy named Patrick uh, Meyer, who used to be a master at that. He would, we, we'd go to Coca Cola and we got out of the hall and you have 10 meetings that weren't planned because you were in a space and you could do that. Yeah. Yep. Bob, I didn't, I wanted to hear from you on this, on this topic too. So uh, I think my perspective as for the opportunities, um, you know, in, in the changed world is that the, the versatility, and I, you know, I heard this in a couple of places. I, my, my crew, um, everyone has to be local, but I, I was really, you know, it, struck by the um, broad uh, range of, you know, someone have mentioned, you know, 25, you know, uh, miles in terms of commutability that, you know, being able to commute to work, that it's really uh, the teams can be in so many different places for you know be a uh, photography uh, still or you know video people for the most part you know uh, are going to need to to be together however what i've seen you know in the, in this period of time is that the need for really um, and i'm not promoting lean leaner budgets but because of the realities that 
um, very versatile, uh, you know, photographers, videographers, uh, as much as, you know, specialists, um, you know, bring, you know, expertise, um, those who can be very adaptable, versatile, work with leaner crews, um, you know, leaner budgets, uh, the expectations have to, you know, shift a little in terms of where they, the, you know, the clients and the projects are, but that's something that, um, I'm, I'm accustomed to working either very lean or can, you know, go big production, but for those projects that, um, you know, might have been acquainted with larger productions that finding ways to, um, you know, to, to work in a much more adaptable and I'm not saying improvised, but, um, you know, as needed, I like to kind of channel my inner MacGyver. Um, and so th those are things that uh, I think, you know, have, have served me well, and uh, I think will be called upon, especially as, you know, to, to many people's points, so there's pent up demand, but there's also, you know, hemorrhaging of, of money and staff and crew and people are, you know, from, you know, my conversations with agency folks, you know, they're taking on that much more uh, in terms of roles that they have to play, which, and they're already stretched thin. So these are, uh, I think, the versatility, the flexibility, um, adaptability. Yeah, Christian. Um, I, I want to add just a very, uh, I try to make it short, guys, I promise. Um, you mentioned about opportunities coming up. Um, Greg, I love listening to the way you explain things because you are 100% right. I mean, like those those points that you make, everyone is making fantastic points, but uh, you know, every now and then we, we get to write some things that is like, oh my God, this resonates with me. And uh, thank you so much everyone for sharing their thoughts. Um, there, there's something that I also examined that. So I, I was a computer programmer for a small agency called Organic when, um, when the bubble pop, when the, when the internet bubble burst. Um, and um, I was, you know, in New York City when, um, when uh, the, the real estate industry, you know, just burst. And um, it seemed like there's a lot of changes coming to our industry because external economical factors, you know, things that are happening, you know, that are economic, econ um, economy based, you know, industries. Industries has collapsed and we have suffered. Um, to, to John was saying, you know, hopefully, you know, big, large businesses will come back. And I mean, like, yes, we're talking about big industries. Um, something that, an opportunity that's coming up, I think, um, is the fact that this has been a, a, a people-led depression. It's the fact that people have not been allowed to be in contact with other people. So it hasn't been an industry-led depression. It has been a virus-led depression. And and when, 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 when I examine that, it's like, my business changed because I cannot be around people. It's not because the bubble burst like the internet or because the, the real estate collapsed or because, uh, you know, CBD took over, uh, you know, this alcohol industry, whatever that might be, okay? Uh, it's because we cannot be together. And with that in mind, I think that as a creative agency, as a creative leader, um, I think it's a fantastic time to once again reinvent the agency structure. Um, just like Madison did it way back in the days and we all fell in love with Matt Man and how they narrated the Madison Ave, you know, live. Uh, and some of us have been around that have seen it from the outside or from the inside. I think that this time is time for us to, uh, Alex, I'm so with you when it comes to like, you know, being in front of people, but the agency has to reinvent. This is almost like the perfect time to do so. Um, I don't, since I started the agency, we do not have account managers. We've never had account managers. We have only hired creative directors because they are called creative account managers, creative directors, art directors, senior art designers, senior designers. You know, they, they fulfill, we are a creatively led agency. We're like what used to be milk, you know, like we are basically creatively led. Milk in South Norwalk? Uh, right now we are, yes. Uh, we, were in, we were in Fairfield. Um, 
you're referring to milk the company. Oh, no, 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 the first milk. Uh, okay. I'm sorry, misspoke, mother. Mother, thank mother, you. Mother, yes. Yeah, yeah, I used to, I used yes, to yep. those guys. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There was an M there. Um, That's right. No, no worries. Yeah, I, think, no, I did some work for those guys like 12 years ago. Yeah, so so Randy, I think that the, the and, 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 and Alex and everyone, I think that the reinvent, we, we could find ourselves in a space where like we have to reinvent the way our agencies are structured yep. and the way we deal with our clients because now there's no this anymore. We yep. can't do this anymore. And we've been in an industry that has been led by, by people. And that's, that's something I, I think that there's a huge opportunity for us to, to you know, rethink our businesses model, uh, models and really you know, tackle the fact that we need to be people's, people's first instead of clients first. Yeah, and Christian, my only, oh. Go ahead. I was gonna say my, my only challenge to rethink is adapt. Because I don't like I don't think we necessarily have to rethink. I think we are forced to like pivot or adapt or figure things out. And I think some of that is how people work best. And so I think Pete had a good one of like just here's how people work best in this situation and are digitally. And here's how I'm gonna present digitally and get the best out of that opportunity. Alex has figured out a way to do his world the best, which is I'm still going to do these one-on-ones or these little crits or still have these things. And I think that's the pivoting and adaptation that we all like have to start figuring out. And what is that for all of us is going to be super unique. And it's going to be, might be unique by person. I have introverts and extroverts and I have people who work really well virtually and independently and others that don't and others that are thriving, just being at home and doing their thing. And they're like, I'm good. I don't need to go back to the office. And others that are like, when like when are we going to do that again right. and so i think that's the adaptation that we're going to have to like start doing it and i think you're 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 rethinking is the right innovation aspect of it but i think it's like here and now of like we're doing it and we're seeing examples of it tonight yeah, yeah. And, and we touched upon it randy said he has somebody in north carolina you said you know you you mentioned that you know all uh, your your network um your network and your employees yeah. and uh, we also talk about how many times we go into the in, into the office, and and uh, uh, Pete is talking about you know the space that he has, and we, we are all absolutely adapting. But the adaptation that we are all going through is uh, is truly well, it's natural amazing. selection, in my opinion, Christian. I think <laughs> what I would say is to, to Greg's point. I, I, look, I, I'm I'm going to say something bold, and I don't want to. I, I I'm hoping to make new friends and not make new enemies. <laughs> but I'm going to say this, like. The word agency, the business model of agency has been broken since the dawn of its, its existence. Like when we had two or three television channels and there was a monopolized amount of view, like after we went from three channels to 30 channels, the agency model was broken. Like the sheer definition of agency is an action or intervention, especially such as to produce a particular effect. That is like, like so therefore we are bought and sold in a transactional model so as so pre-COVID, put COVID aside for a second, I think anything that had a pre-existing condition, it like got killed with COVID um, from a business perspective, in my opinion. I think that if, if we as entrepreneurs don't evolve our business model, how we are compensated, the value that we, we provide beyond that of a thing, then we will only be a transaction. You know, some of my colleagues that are the most successful that own agencies or have been at agencies, you know, I was on a call with, I can't say, say the name because this, this is being recorded, but let's just say that um, one of the largest consultancies on the planet has been trying to buy us for two years, right? I can't say their name, but some of my team is like really pissed off about that. And some of my team's really happy about that. But then when I tell them, like, I'm not interested in getting swallowed up to another big agency, we have bigger we have bigger ideas with the model. We're trying to create community. We're trying to create new types of commerce and new types of ways to interact and exchange value. So I think that like it's natural selection that's at play, right? Mm -hmm. I think that you know when I think about ageism, in my opinion, so I wrote a piece called um, "Bridging Wisdom and Wonder" a couple of years ago, which got some good buzz, and it was inspired by one of my clients who was the, who was at the time the chief marketing officer of a large large brand, and 
she told me after she was moving on that she'd go into rooms and she could feel the fact that she's being discriminated. You know, there's a lot of people that I, I believe that so many of the things that are plaguing our industry are based on the way it's set up. You know, this industry is set up on a set of transactions whereby the more senior you get in the food chain, the less work you do, right? Like, you know, it's like, I have friends who can't even open Sketch, Figma, Photoshop, Illustrator, pick your program of choice, right? Like literally that are like the email and spreadsheets all day, but they started out being art directors and creative directors and concepting, right? So I think that in some cases that reverse pyramid model is broken. Yeah. You know, so I think the thing that's interesting and that I'm actually excited about is finding new ways to deliver value. Because what I'm finding is, I remember when I started my agency, I was always going after and beating the big guys and gals, right? Beating them, either doing work for the mothers or taking the, the work from mother in some cases, right? And it's so funny because now here I am and I'm competing against my former self <laughs> back in the day, right? So what's interesting is I say to myself, well, what do those big shops have that I didn't have? And now I'm thinking about that as a you know small little boutique. So I'm asking myself the question, well, what can I provide to a client that the 20 something year old hot shit designer that's got all the likes on Behance can? Well, I can provide business impact. I can provide strategy. Like I don't sell my time by the hour anymore, right? A lot of my, my teams and the models we have to build, we all charge for that, but I charge based on economic impact right? For, for my energy. So the reason I'm able to do that now is because I've had that experience, but like two, three years ago, I would have never dreamt of that Christian, right? Like, it's so interesting is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think we have to value ourselves more and we have to look out for each other, right? It's not about if I lose the, the job, Alex gets it or Greg gets it. It's about how do we all prop each other up, right? Like, I don't know about you folks, but I'm, I'm going to reach out to Greg after this and say, Hey, Greg, next time I've got an employee branding experience, I'm going to tap into you. Maybe we can collaborate Cause that's not really my jam, but if I get that stuff, maybe we can collaborate and we can all find a way to earn, you know? So, or like, Hey Bob, like I've got this awesome photo gig that like is not really suited for me. Like, I feel like if we come together as a community, like we're doing today, that's how the future of agency creates more value than just being bought and sold. But that's just my sort of diatribe for that. So sorry about that, Christian, you, you ignited my passion. I appreciate you for that. Hey, yeah. One of the things I would say though, and I would just add to what you just said, is that you know? And I'll call the word uh, use coopetition. So sometimes <laughs> like we actually find that I've actually found that sometimes even multiplying ourselves with people who do exactly what we do, we get more uh, because we end up getting more ideas, we get more perspective, and sometimes that really works. And the other thing I would tell you is because I did the experience. Don't sell to a big agency. It's a big mistake. I did that with my agency in New York. <laughs> it's never what you expect it to be. Oh, no, trust me. It's Listen, they, they're, yeah. it's gold, golden handcuffs and earnouts. I like all my friends who sold their agencies are waiting for their non-competes to expire so they can open their next one. And I'm like, why would you run back into a burning house? <laughs> Come on, guys. Exactly right. So, guys, I know we've gone over time here and I appreciate everybody. But just want to give anybody else who hasn't a chance to say something and hasn't had a chance to pipe up in a bit. Uh, please visit all my media. Hold on, Christian. One, one, one switch second. Let me just. Uh, <laughs> Alex, you're going to say something? No, I was just going to say thank, thanks, guys, for doing this. It was a lot of fun and informative. Maybe we should do it again. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I enjoyed it. Randy, what was that word again? Coopetition. 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 <laughs> yeah, I, didn't, I did not invent it for sure. Well, it sounds like, like frenemy. Yeah, it is like I, frenemy. Yes. I, I but, just. I, I know we're uh, here with AIGA, I, you know, as an ASMP person who's now, you know, been able to, um, you know, collaborate with AIGA and uh, I know the organizations are uh, cooperating more in CADC, um, that it, it's really been, um, you know, fruitful. And, and I find that with the photographers, you know, my colleagues as well, that we all, we all benefit and there's, you know, inherent competition, but the cooperation far exceeds. There's, there's enough out there. And for those, you know, it's, it's so truly that uh, collaborative spirit and I, I'm a big proponent of and, and encourage that. So I'm going to have to write, write that one down, but I, I, I want to underscore your, uh, your sentiment that there's, there's um, an ability for each of the, you know, different entities to be able to, um, you know, really, uplift and enhance, you know, each other's uh, opportunities. And I think, you know, everyone has their specialties, even when there's overlap, there's opportunities to, um, to really shine.
So thank you for uh, including me. It's really Certainly. great. So guys, the very last pitch I will say, um, and this is not just because I'm on the AIJ board, but a lot of these insights, one of the things that we are definitely um, even need more of um, as an AIJ community of 300 plus people in the state of Connecticut is more senior insight. And you know, that both comes from, and frankly, even as we've said, getting our people to, uh, to, to engage in things that are free and out there, but even our, ourselves. I think we both A, learn ourselves from it, but I think there's an opportunity and even a responsibility we have to our design community to share our insights. And so I hope all of you will take that to heart when you see the next email for something that's coming up because uh, you know it's been great. And, and I, I look at, I really appreciate everybody uh, joining us tonight. We will definitely do it again. And uh, I hope everybody has a fantastic night. Randy, yes. before we wrap up, can I just say one thing that's really important? Absolutely. So I would love to see more women leader representation in the, in the next one. Um, and just, I think that- um, So they were invited. We had, uh, we had two no-shows that were both women. <laughs> okay, great. No, it, it, again, so, not, not critiquing, but yeah. rather to say like, yeah. I, I myself have woken up to um, just my privilege in a lot of ways recently in the past year or two. And I just think that like some of the conversations I've had on platforms like Clubhouse and some of the things recently, I've just realized like the more that we can get people of, of all walks and talks of life, you know, gender, ethnicity, background, I think that we're all creators. And I just, you know, clearly it's important to you, but I just wanted to put that out there because I do think that um, I'm realizing now just how much talents out there that I think we're not hearing from because we're not inviting enough folks to that stage. I just want to put that out there and don't want to sound like I'm preaching, but um, I, I'm I overtly aware of the challenges that, that come with that. So I'll say that for next time, maybe. Absolutely. All right, folks. Thank you. Hope you all have a night. Thank you. And uh, look forward, hopefully to seeing you all again soon. All right. All right. Take Thanks, care, guys. everybody. Thanks. Bye.